Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the Geeks and Tyrians. I'm here with good old Daniel. Daniel, how you doing, buddy? Doing all right, man. How are you? How are you doing? I mean, it's it's COVID, you know, pandemic, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Just uh, been trying to hold on here and there. But uh, I know I've been reading a lot of comics recently, Just catching up on my comics, ordering some stuff online. Have you? Uh, yeah, I've been buying a, a few comics. Uh, I've been buying more manga because. Uh... Uh, I read more manga than comics. <laughs> I mean, I'm with you on that. I feel like, but I mean, if, I mean, personally to say, like, I feel like it's harder to collect, not harder to collect manga, but it's like, I'm going to leave them. Uh, I'd rather they came in like a big bulk than they, than just like separate volumes personally. But yeah. we can talk about that too. I don't, it don't matter to me because let's talk about what we've been reading so far. And I got some manga here too, but uh, if I move, if I grab one, it's going to mess up my whole order. <laughs> It's literally holding up my a certain shelf right here. Let's see if I can try to pull it out later. Hey, oh, joke there. <laughs> All right, so why don't you start us off, Daniel, since it's been a while. All right, so uh, one of the books I got uh, a little while back um, was Batman White Knight. Uh, hey, <laughs> funny enough, Daniel. Give me. T- I just finished reading that too. Hey, hey! <laughs> I'm waiting for the sequel though. Good <laughs> when they when they have that whole collection out. Oh yeah, I'm waiting for that as well. Oh yeah. So, uh, how about you start it off? Uh, you start it off, and then I then I then I'll follow up. You start off with a uh, Batman White Knight. All right. So Batman White Knight, um, the Joker, he uh, comes across some medications, uh, takes them himself, and mm-hmm. then becomes sane, and then somehow makes all of Gotham go against Batman. You know, making the uh, the Joker the hero while making Bat- Batman the, the villain of the story. Yeah, and not just the, it's and, and the and the one thing I do I will say to continue on what you were uh, talking about, I do like how they portray sort of a sane Joker, and it's not just one medication; it's like a whole, you know, bunch of medications all at oh, yeah. once. Yeah, like right and, at the beginning, they just show you he's like in some mob. Uh, I don't know, it's yeah, it's, a bunch of that. yeah, it's enough to like to overdose basically, and it was enough to somehow make him sane. And this is like, if you ever wanted to talk about the um the relationship between Batman and Joker, I think this is one of the best examples of that. Would you agree? Yeah, um, I would definitely agree. Like, it's a completely different perspective than uh the many of the Batman and Joker stories that we've seen. Yeah, because it's um, in this one, especially you, you'll find out. Uh, and we're recommending this to anyone who's reading it, who wants to read it. You'll find out immediately that um, Batman's kind of insane at the, at the beginning of this book. Like, well, not insane, but like this is like that Zack Snyder ruthless Batman that we've all come to hear about. Yeah, like uh, right off the gate when you start reading, you see Batman going. Uh... You know, like usually he tries to keep civil in his own well way as a hero, but uh, in this case, he just went all out, um, mm-hmm. creating property damage and um, causing harm to uh, uh, civilian lives as well. Yeah, and it's that, and that's the focal point of like Joker's like who he goes by Jack Napier in the book because he's saying now mm-hmm. um, he go he he essentially starts talking about you know Batman. He says he's all good, but he's still a vigilante. He doesn't abide by the laws, you know, all the kind of stuff that we kind of like associate, um, the bad stuff that, you know, we say it as jokes, like, Oh, you know, Batman, he's a cool hero, but you know, he's kind of like doing some shit that he shouldn't. Yeah. And I love how they explore that theme. And I don't know about you, but I also like the whole Harley Quinn, um, story. Yeah. I I do like her story as well. Uh, how, I won't get into too much details uh, with a bunch of spoilers evolving with her. But, uh, mm-hmm. I do like uh, her part of the story and the way she, um, uh, the plot, you know, she does around it. She she's just as a focal point as Joker and um, Batman. Mm-hmm. Like she's she's just as important to the story as the two of them, and, and it's and it's great to see, especially since like considering the long history of Harley always being just the girlfriend of Joker and um, huge symbol of a, of an abusive relationship with the Joker. And now it's sort of like coming to their own and like, you know, they kind of address some of that stuff. By the way, this is an Elseworld, Elseworld, Elseworld story, sorry, where, you know, it's not 
official continuity. It's another universe, another kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just but a it's what a, if. It's a great story. It's so it's, yeah, it's a what if, and it's a great story, really. And I'm glad to hear that they came out with a sequel. I think there's a third one coming out too, right? Like, is there? I I heard there was White Knight too. I I don't know if they yeah, Curse of the about it's White um Knight. Batman White Knight, which is the one we're talking about right now. Uh, Curse of the White Knight, which is the sequel. And I remember reading it online, and I think they're gonna they're playing on the third one because the way I'm not gonna say anything, but you know, the way it ends, it kind of leaves it open to like another book and i would be so down for that i'm enjoying like this world especially um where you can see this being its own thing oh yeah and definitely we have we thankfully got that yeah but, yeah like, uh, the flashpoint uh story where like we see an alternate universe like uh for example like mm-hmm. batman was um uh, was actually uh bruce's dad instead of bruce himself he was the one that got killed yeah and joker is um bruce's mom uh yeah. who went crazy because of the because instead of you know Batman, you know, the parents being shot, it was Bruce that was got shot. Yeah. And, you know, that's in the whole spiraling down. Man, I wish Kelvin was here. He he, he loves that story. Yeah. I mean, even though I don't think he's read the book. He told me he's seen mostly the movie, but he wants to read the book so bad. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll get you the book, man. You just gotta say when. <laughs> yeah. But no, <laughs> you already took one book off my list. Thank you. Um, I think I should follow it up with another DC book. I've, I'm pretty sure the last time we did this, I talked about it. But I think... Um, I've only talked about like certain issues, but I have I still have certain, some of the certain issues in my my back catalog. But I also have the full book of Deceased. So um, nice, yeah. So yeah, this is one. Of, I think they have different covers. I'll have the cover with a with a zombie Superman, and I think there's one with um, a zombie Wonder Woman, a zombie Batman. But uh, actually, I think this one came with like a little. Yeah, this came with like a little, like a little image, like a little poster image of a zombie Batman. Yeah. It's like so. This is kind of like um, DC's take of the whole Marvel zombies. That um, where Marvel zombies was more kind of depressing. <laughs> oh yeah. You give me <laughs> like you oh, give yeah. me the look like. Yeah, yeah. Like I, you could say it's uh, depressing because like uh, it's it was insane too. Because like instead of being just like violent zombies, these are like very sentient, aware zombies with powers. Mm-hmm. Now in this story, it's like um. It's a little hard to take in because it's a lot of um DC lore, like this talk, talking about the anti life equation, um, and stuff like that. And unless you're like a big and unless you're really super into the comic scene of DC, you know, you probably want to know what the heck the life to life equation, but essentially, um, anti life equation plus cyborg, um, equals sort of cyber zombieism. Basically, if um, in the book, there's different ways to get become a zombie. It's mm-hmm. zombie spread. Um, you have all the heroes trying to save everybody else, but the moment someone looks at their phone screen or a screen, anything, say like you and me are we're looking through each other through um, to Zoom, uh, we'd be infected right now. We start you know ripping each other apart. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's kind of like that, but they still do the whole bite thing. So that's one thing. Okay. And essentially, it's sort of the DC universe trying to handle a huge outbreak and how they would handle that. And it's, it gets, it has a lot of dark moments. Like there's a moment where I'm like, oh, like, like, I, I'm not going to go that deep into it. But essentially there's a moment where like, there's just, just, there's a little imps of, of hope and stuff. And but then like, it immediately gets taken away. And the, the words they use is very um synonymous to a certain character mm-hmm. is that um you would, re- you would think like, everything's gonna be fine. But like, seconds later everything goes to shit and but there's still sort of sense of like you know hope which is surprising because i just talked about you know they take it away but like there's it's not dreadful and every character that is in it has a lot of great moments um green arrow is probably one of the best ones in the book and um everything you think would happen kind of does happen and there's a, not saying it's the rest of your expectations but there's moments where you're like, oh, you know, if they have, you know, this one guy, it'd be, it'd be fine. Guess what? They took that guy out immediately at the oh. beginning. Okay. So that person can't solve your problems now. You have to figure it out on your own. I'm like, oh, that's actually a smart idea to do it. Because, like, you immediately someone, this certain person would probably figure it out. And they kind of did, but it's too late for them. They got infected. Yeah. But there's still, but there's still like, that sort of um, emotional crutch, especially um, for certain characters. Um 
This is one of the. This is one of, also one of those examples that I keep saying. Like other people write Damian Wayne better than than most than his natural continuity. Yeah, because like uh, Damian Wayne, son of Batman, he can be a little shit. And this one, he was like, you kind of feel for him. And it's not saying that he's like the a focal character. He's kind of a focal character. I'll give you that. But um, he has a lot of um emotional moments, and it was a real fun read. Plus, if you get this uh this this copy, which is like has like all the all the story and Daniel, I know I told you this before. They have um they they when this was coming out issue by issue, they had some variant covers. Um, you know, just like some some different characters like zombies. Like here's one with Harley Quinn and Dark Side. But like um they they had some um clearly inspired by movie posters. Yeah. Like the first issue was um DC says like a little raw Ro- is Robin and Joker, but they're doing like the the it thing with the balloon. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and there's one with like Yorona, where it's like um, the Harley Quinn, and I think I showed you that one. There's one, um, I think it was Ghost Ship or something like that, or um, but no, it's like different ones, and they did a Conjuring one, which is pretty funny to me. Oh. But um, it's it's a really fun book. It, it I was I'm I'm saying fun, but I'm like it's a fun read, and it's a uh, very um emotional at times too, and it's it's something you wouldn't expect from a zombie book because we were used to the whole zombies being. Oh, this isn't that. That this is one of those few ones that really explore the idea of a zombie outbreak from the human perspective. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. I'll admit that. Yeah. Uh, what you got for us, Daniel? All right, this one's a, a, a bit more lighthearted and Yay. a bit larger too, and size wise. So uh, this here is just a like Super Mario Adventures. <laughs> that is super lighthearted. Yeah, so basically, uh, this is a collection of all the, the Super Mario Adventure comics that were in uh, the Nintendo Power magazines back in the mm-hmm. I think in the nineties. So it has all of the story right here collected. It's very lighthearted. It still has the anime um, manga feel to it as well. Nice, uh, very charming, very goofy and fun. And mm-hmm. you, you do see a lot of uh, character development that you don't normally see in the games as well. Like I hear the biggest complaint about Mario is that he's just happy. That's about it. You do uh, get a sense of his character and the, and uh, the comic here as well. He's mm-hmm. funny. Uh, he's goofy. Like he, he does have a sense of hero and uh, heroism with him and everything. Mm-hmm. And so is Peach, it? Uh, no, no. Go ahead. I'll, I'll I'll say when you're done. Yeah, and then uh, Princess Peach is not really the damsel in distress because uh, yeah, like right at the beginning, yeah, Bowser comes up, uh, attacks the kingdom. He, uh, he doesn't uh, kidnaps the princess actually. The princess actually goes after Bowser because uh, something happened with the Mario Brothers, mm-hmm. and so he, and she goes out of her way trying to stop uh, uh, King Bowser herself. So is it kind of like those? Um, I remember reading them a while back. It's kind of like they had a, like a Legend of Zelda manga based on the games. Like there was a Ocarina of Time one. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Like in a sense, you could tell like it's based around maybe around Super Mario World, but mm-hmm. uh, it's mostly it's a it's a thing. Okay, because like when I was thinking about the Legend of Zelda one, it was a it was an a manga adaptation of the Ocarina of Time, with yeah, Link like, talking. Like it's weird. <laughs> yeah, like they have a lot of those. Like they covered Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess. Like, yeah, and I, I find it weird because like that one is one of the few times I've seen where they try to develop a romance between Zelda and Link, mm-hmm. and I'm just like, what the heck? Wait, wait I thought never mind. <laughs> it was it was that was, was that was weird because I'm always I'm used to silent Link, like yeah. not saying a word. Just the hoot, hit, hoot, all that stuff. Or oh man, that sounds like awesome person. though. No, not for like Or in Wind Waker, you hear him say, "Come on." Oh yeah, come on. Um, the one book I have, um, it's it's an independent book. It's by Terry Moore. It's called Motor Girl. In this book, um, I got finished. I finished it in one day because it was such a great read. Um. It's very black and white. It's a lot of inks and cross hatching and stuff like that. But essentially, it's about um, how can I explain without like spoiling? That's the problem. That's the problem there, isn't it? But it's um, what what could I say? What could I say? Essentially, it's a story about this veteran who just came back from war, who clearly is going through PTSD. And you start wondering what is real and what it's not, because at some point there's a giant talking gorilla 
and there's UFOs and people um, just look at her like she's crazy. And you start to realize what's really going on as you read and everything starts to make a lot more sense. And like, as you get to know more of the character, I'm trying to remember her name off the top of my head. Um, I can't. Is it? No, Libby is Libby's another one. But basically, it's just it's a lot of fun characters. But the whole. Uh, yeah, her name is Libby. Oh. But no, it's it's just it's just you, it's just really a book about trauma, and sort of a perspective. And it's like with PTSD and that kind of stuff. But, and you kind of see where this where she's coming from and how this one thing you know changed her whole life, and like how each character kind of represents a, a sort of trauma that happened to her or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, something along those lines, yeah. and it's a real fun read. You're you gonna say something? Oh no, no, no! I was just, uh, I was just listening. Yeah, it's. Uh, I really recommend it. It's, it's, it's not that long. It, you know, it's just, it's like five chapters, five uh, issues, and the art is, is pretty simple, but it's really detailed. Like this one, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to find right now. It was, it was a real good look. It's kind of like. Dude is like sitting in the middle. Yeah, like dude sitting in the middle of nowhere, like Kansas or whatever, and he's just like, "What is life?" I mean, yes, it's simplistic, but it works. Yeah, it's simplistic, but it works, and it's a it's a great read. You got anything else for us, Daniel? Uh, comics wise, no. I, I'm mostly just out of mangas uh, at the moment right now. And go for it, man! I'm stopping you. All right. Uh, one. Uh, take a uh, recommendation from Guillermo del Toro when he was uh working with Kojima with the ill-fitted uh, Silent Hills project. Uh, what could have been? Yeah. He was... Uh, he mentioned about Junji Ito being one of his favorite uh, manga <laughs> artists and authors. Due to the, uh, oh, Jesus. I've seen the art. Yeah, and so the one story he brought up was uh, was called Gyo, because he kept, he imagined himself trying to, uh, while reading the story, you know, trying to outrun uh, a shark on land and eventually getting eaten by the land shark. Yeah, Junji Ito, um, he's he, he's known as being like the, the horror manga artist. Like his his sense of detail and like just it's and it's kind of it's kind of like um Lovecraftian horror at the same time. It, it, it kind of in a sense too, like uh yeah, when you look at it, at his art, there's a lot of horror, dread, and disgust that happens in there, but in his weird sense, has its own beauty to it as well. Yeah, because I'm trying to remember. What book? It, what manga book it was? I think it was about the planet, the planet that was like gonna collide with the Earth, and there was a lot of um, dread and like chaos going around the people. Like I could have sworn, like they started crucifying people at some point in that book. And I was like, holy crap! And then like it was so somehow able like, to come out with a little hope. There's a little twist at the end too. And it was a little funny, but um, it was just. Jesus Christ, the level of detail and horror mm-hmm. that person goes through. Um, that pers- and just how fucked up a person can go in terms of fear. I was like, Jesus Christ, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then, go ahead, man. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Oh, no, no, no. You can finish first. I don't know. I was going to talk about the next book I have on me. Oh, okay. okay. So, I mean, the, the next book I have... Um, so I'm a huge Daredevil fan. I've gotten the recent Daredevil book um, by a writer named Chip Sadarsky. And dude, this uh, this is probably one of those uh, more character-driven stories of Daredevil. Um, he has to live with guilt. And if you're Catholic, you kind of know what that is. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a really good start to a story, but uh, I'm not going to go that deep into it. Because um, I feel like if I do, it just pretty much um, leads to spoilers. But essentially, you know, Daredevil has to accept the fact that he did something. Even though he claims he didn't do it, but he he has to accept the fact that he did. And now everyone's kind of on him for what he did. And he has to, like, find a way to, you know, pull himself back together. By maybe the next book, because it just ends in a way, it ends in a cliffhanger kind of situation. So it's a great read for if you ever want to start reading Daredevil and sort of following the next book that comes along with it. But yeah, 
You got anything for me, Daniel? Not that I can think of. No, like, uh, I think the only ones I'm currently reading at the moment is just the Berserk series right now. You can talk about Berserk, bro. I love Berserk. Yeah. Berserk. Uh, amazing dark fantasy stories. Very violent. Uh, I love the, the monster and demons that, uh, that you come across in uh, the manga as well. Like, the way they're so drawn uh, vividly and in a horror kind of way. It's like, I'm trying to remember like- just one. Let's see, there was like. It was a while, like it's one at the very beginning too, in the first volume that I have. Basically, uh, God's entered this kingdom, and there's like this uh, weird uh, king, and it turns out like he's been like taken over by this weird uh, demon parasite kind of looking thing. Mm-hmm. And then we see his true form. Like, ooh, uh, words can't describe like how he looks after he shows his true form, because once you see it, you're just shocked by it. Yeah, I remember you know reading Berserk a while back, and. It took me a while to get used to. It was a lot of like, um, it's very dark. Mm -hmm. Like the world, it's like, this is a step above the messed up stuff you would see on Game of Thrones. At least maybe one or two. Yeah, like the things you see here, like, um, they are very dark. Um, everything bad will happen to almost every character, even the protagonist himself. He has a very tragic story uh, behind him and in his past. And, throughout the story that you're reading yeah no and it's and you were talking about the art the art is gorgeous yeah like they keep trying to recreate that art for like the anime adaptations but the they could never they just can't nail it the 91 the nine the one in the 90s was close like but like yeah they i would say this you can take a pat not a, like one of those um one full page panel uh, scenes from uh from Berserk, and you just don't need to explain anything. You just, you just look at how amazing that is, yeah. and they try to recreate that, but it's, it doesn't have that level of detail and like. Also, because I think it's because it's colored, because like Berserk kind of lives in the black and white spectrum. Yeah, like that kind of be the problem with Berserk and most of the stories with Juji Ito too, because like the way like the art is so detailed and drawn out, it's kind of uh, very difficult to animate. You know, precisely just like the art without making any sacrifices or taking so much time to do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what happened with the 20, was it 2017 or 2018? Like, I think about it was 2017, but like that. Berserk 2016, 2017. For uh, Berserk anime. Yeah. The like, second one. Yeah, almost the majority of the anime uh, from the 2017 adaptation is done completely in. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and CG, and it did not look good. It was like uh, one of the first animes that uh, Japan would try to do in uh, CG instead of like the traditional style. Mm-hmm. And they try to do it in a way um, that encapsulate the, the the work that you saw in um, in the book. And it wasn't a high budgeted one either, too. So it was never going to look good. And half the times they would recreate like images from the manga, but it just didn't feel right. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that level of like there was a um, there was a certain battle between two, the the main character guts and like the this pr- evil priest whatever, and like in the in the book it's like so detailed that you know there's weight, but in the in the show it was just like they're just standing there, you know, trying to recreate the the image, but it just it didn't, it didn't land hard. Yeah, like I was just yeah. thinking because I I know this is a common practice in Japan too with anime. Uh, sometimes uh, they'll do like cut corners around here just to make it to the airtime and then whenever a mm-hmm. blu-ray release comes out they um they finally finish like whatever animation they had they weren't able to finish in time for airing mm-hmm. and so whatever it finished goes under the blu-ray uh release instead and so i took a look at the blu-ray release and it fixed some problems but everything was still blurring you know filled with flaws and everywhere mm-hmm. it, which kind of yeah. sucks too because we we're now starting to get animes with good CG with uh, like B Stars, Land of the Lustrous, and I believe, yeah, I believe the one on the Netflix original High School, um, yeah, High School uh, Girl, yeah, that's yeah. on CG as well. Dora, I can't really pronounce that one right because I don't Is even know. Hidoro? Yeah, something like that, some weird name like that. Like, um, I haven't seen that it. one's all CG. Is it? Yeah, that one's all CG. But it kind of it, it works because like the detail wasn't as complex as the as the manga in Berserk. Yeah. But yeah. 
I mean, like, yeah, Goblin Slayer, like, a, yeah, it did use CG for mostly uh, the main character himself because he's always wearing armor and there's just so much details to his armor all over his body and everything. But mm -hmm. it's done well that, yeah, you see it at times, but it doesn't really, like, distract from the story or anything from the, the anime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to another book that I have on me. Um, I'm really come. Um, I really don't have that many books left. It's I have like three, and well, now two. If I talk about this one, um, this one's called Paper Girls. It's another independent book. It's from uh, Image. Um, basically, if you ever want to read about time traveling, um, paper, uh, pa paper girls, um, this is the book for you. And it it's fun because like they they go into like different like eras and stuff like that trying to go home and there's a lot of crazy stuff like in this book this is like the fourth book there's a giant robot battle oh okay right. yeah it's like <laughs> and it's it's a little hard to to get into i'll i'll, I'll be honest with that because it starts off kind of slow and you have to like not slow but it, start, it hits you with a lot of stuff and you have to like go back and reread some stuff i know i have to like reread like the first two books um again and again to understand what was going on and it's one of those also those stories that so sci-fi stories that have their own language so you're like wait wait okay i, I need to reread that because like it's it's english but it's like it's kind of like broken not, not broken english but it's like worded differently like there's no gra there's grammar missing punctuations are wrong or and they're using like slang that was like from early 2000s i'm like wait what's going on Oh, so it's, it's like a drag and drop kind of thing. Yeah, it's kind of like that, and it's and the the characters are all kind of are all likable to an extent, and they're all kind of unique in their own little way. Like there's um one girl who's like the new girl; she doesn't know what's going on, and she immediately has to be snuck into this whole world. And one of the things that happens is that a you know let's go to the past. We end up going to the past to like prehistoric America. Look what's going on here, and you're like. Wait, what's going on? What's going on? And like, as you go along, a lot more stuff gets revealed. And it's made and it's written by um Brian K. Vaughn, who's like a well known comic book writer. He's he. I don't know if you read Saga. Saga. Uh, I heard of it, but yeah, it's like it's like that. He wrote that. Um, he wrote the Runaways, uh, Marvel Runaways. Mm -hmm. Um, what else did he write? He wrote Why the Last Man, which is one of my favorite books. No, oh, I heard about it. I heard it was really yeah. Good. That one's really good. And we might talk about it another time, but um, it's uh, he he's proven himself to be a great writer, and he he can do a lot of stuff with different characters. He makes you like at least every character, or you know, every character has this you know character. You know, there's something different about each one of them, and you kind of like remember each one. Like this one, I can't remember her name off the top of my head. She was kind of like this like queen regal kind of thing, and there was this one dude. He has his own little thing going on, but he was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's 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 Paper Girls. I recommend it because it's it, one, it's greatly written, and two, it's a lot of. If you want to get hit with that nostalgia bug, go for it because they start talking about like early two thousand stuff. Like there was there's one point in the book where they end up going to like New Year, like um December, like basically the day before New Year's or two thousands, and everyone's like, "Oh, I'm scared because of the Millennium Bug. Oh, Y two K. Yeah, oh, we're all screwed." And the giant robots are fighting, <laughs> and everyone's like, "Oh, it's the end, man! It's the end! It's Doomsday is here, man! It's here! Game over, man! Game over!" Kind of stuff, and it's like so. <laughs> it's it's kind of funny, and that it's they're doing a Y two K thing, and there's giant robots fighting. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. That's 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 clever. I like that. But uh, yeah, you got any book for us or anything? Yes, uh, yeah, this one was actually like a while, while back, but I do remember reading this book called uh, American Born Chinese. Yes, I remember that book. I'm trying to get Kelvin to read that. Yes, uh, it's so if good. He needs to borrow a copy. I have a copy you can borrow. Oh, yeah. We'll let him know. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, American Born Chinese is a, you know, is a comic which is, uh, has like, has stories between like different, uh, you know, characters throughout the story. Like, uh, they're not interconnected, but there's different stories that goes on. For example, there's one about like uh, this Chinese immigrant. He moves to America and he has to deal with people, you know, appropriating uh, stereotypes against him and discriminating against him. And there's mm -hmm. another. Uh, they even show a different story of 
this one guy who he's really embarrassed of his cousin because his cousin acts so stereotypically Chinese, you know, like he he's got the 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 the, the buck teeth, the, yeah, the like yellow they, eyes and super narrow. I mean, round face, super narrow eyes. Yeah, like he it's like they, he uh, transferred school many many times because every time his cousin comes to visit, he embarrassed him uh, just because uh, his uh, cousin was unintentionally stereotypical. But uh, that was just mm-hmm. him. And I remember that one because it was played. It was kind of like played off like it's a sitcom. Yeah. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Yeah, and and what? And Go ahead. There's even one more where it's just like a, a Monkey King one. Yeah, a very famous uh, Chinese uh, story. Yeah. The uh, the Journey to the West. Yeah, other than that, like, I'm pretty sure lots of people would love that story, especially uh, people that were uh, immigrating from different countries, you know, mm-hmm. not just China. Cause, uh, what, I lo- what I liked about that story was that how in kind of like, it's so it's three different stories, like you said. Yeah. Um, uh, immigrant Chinese kid, um, dude who has a overly racist stereotype cousin. Like, it's like if you and me had a cousin that was like super cholo. Yeah, you know, like, like imagine we have him on a podcast right now. It's like, hey, Holmes, que pasa? You know, hey, kind of like, modelo. Yeah. Like and that kind of stuff and like you were like oh come on man we're not trying to do that right now yeah. and then there's the 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 very um well-known story of the monkey king a very you know it's uh, i wouldn't i don't know what i don't know what, what book i can relate it to uh, you know most americans mm-hmm. but that's kind of like their their story that's their most well-known story it's a very celebrated story mm-hmm. and those you know each one has to do with like culture and appropriation and immigrants and the way they all tie those three stories together it's just it was great. Yeah. I remember reading it back in high school, and a lot of people didn't get it because, like, they don't they don't know much, they didn't know that much about Asian culture. Um, you know, I came from a school that was min- that was like yeah, a bunch of minorities, but there wasn't really much of an Asian you know little focus there. Sadly, yeah, yeah. there wasn't enough uh, Asian students to you know help us right. learn. But thankfully, the teacher was trying to make us learn. But a lot of kids were like. Uh, I'm not getting it, kind of stuff. Yeah, like, damn it, like, uh, I kind of get that, but I just feel like people were like trying to associate more. Um, okay, this is probably just I get it more if I was Chinese, but really, I think it might be because like they're not immigrants themselves, or they don't like maybe a relative that's just as embarrassing uh, to mm-hmm. them. I mean, I got the whole like, you know, and this is gonna be like a bit of a tangent, but like, you know, if they made one for Hispanics, I think. It'd be it wouldn't work as well because kind of like I don't know from us you know we're both of Mexican descent mm-hmm. half the time when we see um, stereotypical representation of us uh, usually we just kind of like bat an eye we don't really like I don't know I've poke, I I've noticed that I don't know about you like I mean, speaking Gonzalez kind of was like that's a racist interpretation of Hispanics or something like that but we just don't we're just like eh hey, whatever like yeah like, I, I, yeah I don't think any yeah there's a lot a lot of negative stereotypes about Mexicans and. And they don't seem to bother me. They don't seem to bother my family. Um, we don't really pay attention to it at all. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think sometimes we might even embrace it at times. Like, uh, for example, I remember Speeding Gonzalez was considered racist, but I love Speeding Gonzalez. Uh, everyone that I know from Mexico, they love Speeding Gonzalez. Mm-hmm. That's kind of so. It's kind of. I don't think it would have worked. That's what I'm saying. I'm not. I mean, there is one. I mean, I probably didn't know about it or. Yeah, like you really that. have to try to offend us mm-hmm. um, in order, uh, you know, with stereotypes or whatever like that. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's, we're almost nonchalant or laid back about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's, but I mean, like, it's, you, there's a lot of things you can say, like, oh, you know, that's a racism tradition. The Mexicans will call it out. But we're, most of the time, we're just like fine with it or whatever. It's, the, it's, we honestly don't. Care. That, yeah. Like, we have that. Like, I was telling, yeah, because, like, I mean, the whole, Honestly, if it was Mexican, it, it, what would happen is that like, it was a kid coming from Mexico. Um, the racist stereotype would be like a super cholo cousin or whatever mm-hmm. that um, just just oozes cholo, and I'm like, oh no! But somehow everyone would like him, yeah. and because <laughs> that's a it's a style now. And probably the the story would probably be um, Pancho Villa or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was that was a great book. Um, I'm trying to get Kelvin to read it because like um, he's he's always up to like about. And representation especially asians mm-hmm. so i think he would really enjoy that book um 
next book I have. Um, technically, I might have maybe one or two more, but um, we'll see how this goes. But essentially, I have um, the new um, Venom by Donny Cates. So this is the guy who basically is kind of like um, Marvel's... Um, that's their golden boy. He's writing a lot of stuff. Like, um, I know recently he hyped up this new story. Uh, by the time I'm recording, it's not out yet, but it's going to be out by December called The King in Black. And if you want to know what that's about, you got to, you know, this probably is a good starting point. It's a reintroduction of like Eddie Brock as Venom. And it's like, it introduces like new lore to like the whole um, symbiotes, mm-hmm. the little alien things that attach to them. Like, Daniel, did you know they have a god? Oh, I did not. Yeah, his name is Noel, which apparently if you're um, from a certain area in Europe, it's kind of a funny name to have. Um, yeah, he's like the god of the symbiotes. He was around since the Celestials. Oh. He, he He's known as the Celestial Killer. He had like um, a weapon that was known to kill gods. It was, it was uh, the all-black sword from, I don't know if it was from a Thor book. They like, you know, he had that and like he can control all the symbiotes. And um he changes a lot of stuff too, like the little spider that we all thought that um was from a uh, Spider Man or whatever. No man, that's actually a dragon. I'm like, uh what? Yeah, no, I was like, what? <laughs> what? Uh I kinda like the one that was a spider, that made more sense. But no, it's like he's like this whole like godlike being. And the thing is Eddie Brock doesn't fight him. He fights like his. What's the best way to explain it? It's like if Goku were to fight Frieza, but Frieza wasn't really there. It was just like an apparition of him, and Frieza was still asleep. Like he's just sleeping, and we're trying to make sure he doesn't wake up. Oh, it's Boo. It's Boo. Oh, is it Boo? <laughs> it's basically Boo now that I think about it. <laughs> we're trying to make sure Boo doesn't wake up, or else we're screwed. Because then we get Kid Boo, and then we're, and then it's another screwed level. But no, it's um, it's in, it's introducing new stuff to um, to the to to the whole universe of Venom, um, new stuff with the symbiotes, and this is a great starting point. And like one of my favorite things is that like, we find out that Peter Parker wasn't the first person in, in on Earth to have symbiotes. Symbiotes were around since like Norse mythology time. Yeah, and like. They were monsters. They were like, it starts off with like the story about like you know Grendel, um, the Beowulf stuff. Oh yeah. And like they're like, where's Beowulf? Grendel is coming, and you don't know this. You don't know what it is until like later on. That um, it's it's basically a symbiote. If it's a, if it's it's a book about Venom, it's gonna be a symbiote. Mm. And the artist Ryan Stegman, he was supposed to come to this year's Comic Palooza. I was so excited. Cause, dude, the artist, the art is great. Like, I mean, let me find it. Like, there's like a corrupted Venom look, and it was great. Let me see if I can pull it up right here. That is sick. That is, it's sick. And like he, yeah, and like he was doing a lot of like, and he's like a really great artist. And I was like, yo, if Ryan Stegman is coming to Kong Palooza, does that mean the writer for this book is coming too? Cause he's, he's not one of my favorite writers. Like, like that's just it. I'm 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 in love with the dude's writing. He's yeah. always writing about swords and gods and god killers and stuff. I'm like, yo, that sounds badass. And he's like, and like the next book I have is also made by him, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But no, if you ever want to read like um some cool, crazy like stuff that's gonna probably pay off as it goes along, then yeah, this is probably one of the good places to start. His venom is good. He, he leads to like a book. Uh, absolute carnage which is um carnage is back and he's trying to wake up that um symbio god and he's out hunting and ripping people's spines off to get like some symbiote stuff that was left behind in your dna or whatever huh. and i'm just like that's pretty metal <laughs> oh that is <laughs> yeah so he, like he, i'm like that's badass all right so you got another book for us uh no, I'm actually fresh out of books about now. Okay, so I mean, we're about to hit the 40 minute mark, so I can probably pull out two more books out of my ass. Hope, thankfully, it's not out of my ass. It's in, it's just out of my little bookshelf. So I'll start out. Which one should I start to go with? You know what? I'll go with this book. It's manga. Since I'm, since I'm mostly talking about comics, so, you know, I'll probably start talking about some manga. So 
Dan, you you know I'm a big Gun- Mobile Suit Gundam fan. So what? You know I'm a big Gundam fan. Oh yes, yeah. I think it's. I mean, oh, that thing back there, I didn't notice. Oh, you didn't notice? You want me to show you the little piece of artwork I made? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what? Fuck it. Absolutely. You know, scratch board of a Gundam unicorn. Oh, that is very yeah. nice. Thank you. Took me uh, like three days. But so essentially, and this is a book that I recommend anyone who wants to get into Gundam, especially when we're talking about the original series. So the book I have is Gundam The Origin. This is a 12 um, volume book. Uh, this is the first volume. And it's drawn by the original. I'm trying to put it back so I can at least keep my shelf intact. Um, it's drawn by the original artist for the show back in 1979, where this is essentially a retelling of the show, and it came out in like the mid early mid 2000s. So essentially, it's a more up to date known of the story. So you're not gonna get it's not gonna be exactly the same as the show, but you're gonna get more into detail, and that kind it kind of got adapted into like an anime that is called Gun the Origin, which me and Kevin talked about. You guys can go check that out. Um, but no, it's a retelling. So if you ever wanted to get into like that show, the first show, but the animation is kind of a drawback because it's from the 70s. And I get it. And if the original TV show and or movie doesn't do it for you, I recommend the books. And the, the art is... God damn it, I got to pull it out again. <laughs> Phrasing. But um, the art is fantastic. It's, 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 it's a lot of like, like ink strokes. So like I don't know if I can get that to show up on the camera, but like, it's it's like old stu- old school manga art. Oh yeah, that you can really see, and especially with the with the, the use of inks and shadows and all that stuff. And I always like the way he draws hair; like he just draws them like really smooth and nice. But it's 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 a retelling of the whole show, um, and with added detail that is meant to give you an idea of the world. Like how this war started, you know, and why these people are against each other. So it's it's a lot of a, it's a really great read, and it's a really it's one of the reasons why how I got into the show, into the series and how I became such a massive fan of it, and and I captured it pretty well. And I, I enjoy both the anime, the movie adaptation, and this adaptation. So I kind of prefer this one because it's a little faster read. So yeah. I don't know you feel like checking that one out. Let's see. Uh, yeah, they got my girlfriend animation. I mean, older animation has never bothered me. I mean, I grew mm-hmm. up watching Speed Racer, and I still like to go back and watch it, despite its uh, dated, uh, you know, everything. Yeah. So we're gonna end it off with a Marvel book, and I think we got twenty minutes left. We can probably talk about this book because one, the art is stunning, and two, um. I'll probably end up reading the little letter that's at the end. So this book, also by Donny Cates, the same guy who also did Venom. This is why I'm saying he's one of my favorite writers. This is probably one of the best books I've read in a long time. It's five issues. And I couldn't put it in my usual bookshelf next to my Gundams. I had to put it right here to help keep it up. And that is Silver Surfer Black as I try to bring it all the way up. Oh, nice yeah it's 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 a lo- it's a bit of a bigger book than most ones if i can just get him in frame oh it's like probably just about as big as this mario book i just showed up yeah and it's the it's like i said earlier it's written by a guy by donny cates and this art is by trad Moore, and i i'm so glad that they decided to do it this big because do the art if it was smaller it would not do it justice because the art is trippy it is trippy. Like I gotta let me see if I can put this in frame. Oh why? Wow. Yeah, it has that classic like uh, retro Marvel uh, comic look to it. Yeah, and Fred Moore is really great with that. So essentially, this is between two books, but you can kind of read this on by itself. Essentially, you know, essentially, um, Silver Surfer had to save his uh, some some of the Guardians of the Galaxy from a from a black hole, and in saving him, saving them. He ends up going back in time, so he ends up coming across a lot of well-established, you know, cosmic beings from the Marvel universe. 
but the first person he meets is no that symbiote god yeah and you see how much of a badass he can be like he's being the crap out of silver surfer but uh, you know something that surfer has noticed is that his power is weak and he's not the same you know strength as he was so he's off trying to figure out what to do and it's a lot of personal thought and a lot of questions about existence and uh the idea of light versus dark um i don't mean good as neo but it's more like the the idea of light versus the idea of dark you know mm-hmm. no symbiote god that's it's all black and he's trying to bring like you know light into the world and it kind of ties into his um origin like it's a, there's a point where like he's rem- reminiscing about his time as galactus's herald and how he knew what he was doing and he chose to do nothing with all these different lives and I, like, there's a point where he talks about like how each um planet kind of revered him um some of them saw him as a savior some of them worshiped him um they wanted him they wanted him to stop galactus but he just sat there and did nothing and he sort of starts like he starts to contemplate a lot of stuff and it's a lot of like uh things that you know if you come to know about sort of surfer and his relationship with galactus and it's kind of also is explored a little bit here. It's gonna end up being sort of one of the one. It's one. It's one of the best reads, and the art is just stunning. And I remember reading um, that he originally had a different idea for this book, but that all changed because of um, he had to change the story because at the time when he was writing writing up the idea for it, uh, Stanley had passed away. Oh. So he and he so Donnie Cates in a way made this book to be a sensitive honor of Stanley. So and it even has like a little um letter to Stanley that I that honestly it just like kind of almost took me to tears. And um it basically saying, you know, Stan was one of my heroes. He, you know, inspired me to do a lot of my a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now. I remember and he talks about the first time he ever met Stanley and like um he says, like, you know, Stan, he tells Stan, like, you know, I can never do what you did. And Stan is like, well, you can at least try. And look where he is now. He's like Marvel's hit guy. He's yeah. the one making a lot of books. I would read the whole thing, but it's a, it's a bit of a wordy, a bit of a wordy letter. Wait. Unless you want me to read it. <laughs> Man, it's a long letter, but uh, yeah, I would suggest, like, probably just go out. I'll probably be better off getting the book itself than like reading it uh, to myself and having. Yeah, it. no, it, it's it's a great book, and I'm telling you, the art, and I'm trying to go with one that's not spoilery, but the art is just super trippy. Like this this panel right here, like his his mouth is seething and stuff, and it's just like super, like, like there's just so much going on in there. So much going on, in it. and if you pay attention to how like, it flows, it's just there's a sense, it's it's everywhere, but there's a sense of fluidity at the same time. Like I'm trying to remember which one it was. Um, there, there's a um, there's a moment where like he's like moving around like inside a inside this one area, and like there's like little ink blot little blots around the the page, and where um, it shows like him doing like uh, here you know what here's a good example, like right here in the first panel. I don't know if uh, I can't really describe it well uh, for the audio listeners. That's probably, uh, um. Essentially, he's going around in his, his little blots showing him and transforming into like his board into different weapons. And I was like, dude, that's badass. And it's it's such a fun read. I think it's one of my favorite books from in, in a long time for Marvel. Uh, I would talk about another one, but I already promised Kelvin we'd talk about that one. So, yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, like uh, Silver Server Black uh, looks very interesting. I love the art. Um, like I said before, it looks retro, and like it does have like a weird like a uh, like trippy stuff going on in the background. I do want to go ahead and uh, you know, take a look at it because I do want to mm-hmm. know like a uh, whatever that he had on his hand. Like was that like those Infinity Stones infused with him, or or what was that? Well, that's um, I can't really say what it is because I'd be um, it's not that it's spoiler, but like it's important to the plot. But yeah. essentially, um, this is where I mean like the whole like you know light versus darkness thing comes along because it's kind of consuming him it's like draining the light out of him mm. kind of thing and it's 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 a great read dude it's like i mean i finished it in like a day and i'm like 
kind of want to read it again. I'm looking at it right now. I'm like, I don't want to pick it up. <laughs> but no, um, you know, this, is, this has been mostly a chill episode. We've been talking about a lot of books we can read. Um, hopefully, we can do more of this kind of stuff later on. Have you read any of the X Men stuff? Like, uh, no, it's been a while. I've... Yeah, it's been a while since I've read any X Men stuff. Dude, I recommend checking out, and you can buy this on um in, on Amazon, the House of X, Powers of X. Mm-hmm. So basically, you know, when it was coming out, it was like one two different series, but like they kind of like they're kind of separate, but then they start to to come together. Like, like, you know, the, the, the two strands that's kind of end up being tied together. And there's a lot of cool stuff. A lot of, um, I was talking to Gus about this and he was like, he, he likes it, but he just finds it weird that, um, we're kind of making X and more of a fantasy based kind of thing going around. Cause there's a lot of trees and like magical stuff going around. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. There's a moment in the book involving Wolverine and Nightcrawler that you're going to be like, bruh, bruh. No, actually, I think I did recommend you this book because uh, it was the book that I told you that where Apocalypse um, teams up with the X Men. Yeah, and he has to like about, uh, House of X. Yeah, no, and like there's a, there's a scene where uh, Apocalypse has to like die defending the X Men. I'm like, what? Are you Apocalypse? The big band of X Men? What? That's crazy. And it, and the stuff that later on revealed is like even more like. The 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 story they're going on right now, the new X Men stories. Um, I think they're okay. They just they 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 build up something so big. That they're trying to like, I'm waiting for that big payoff, and you know they're taking their time with it. And I'm like, oh, come on, man! I just want to read. <laughs> I don't want to see what happens with with the X Men. Um, I might start bringing in more manga. And I have to find ones that are that are like at least not as known, because um, I have like mostly like Naruto and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And like Dragon Ball Z, or something along those lines. You know, it's like I said, manga is weird to 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 get. It, sometimes it is, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, I think that's about it because I don't think we can talk about anything else. Yeah, no, um, I I think that's about everything. Yeah, because this has been a fun. This this has been one of those things where um, we're just talking about the books we're reading because, like, one, it's we like to hear what we're reading, and two. It's like give you guys an idea of you know what's out there to read, and I hope we did a good job of it. I know we're trying. I might try to do this again with uh, Kelvin whenever um, he's back up to speed. There's uh, this has been a fun episode um, for those of you guys who like to listen to us. Be sure to follow us on all these podcasting sites from Castbox, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Castbox, Spotify, Pandora. You know the, the usual stuff. Also, if you'd like to watch the video version of this on YouTube, go check those out over there. Subscribe to us. Hit the bell icon, link, you know, like button, whatever. You know, the usual stuff that you kind of see every now and then when it comes to YouTube. Comment and all that good stuff. Also, we do have a Patreon. And, you know, Patreon's been kind of weird for us recently. But we try to do our best with it. And we hope for you guys to support us in any way. Because there's a lot of stuff that me, Kelvin, Daniel, Joey, and we all have like crazy ideas we want to do, but you know, sadly, we can't do them without a little bit of, you know, money, money. And, you know, it also shows us that we're probably doing something great. Be sure to follow us on social media for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all with the Geek Centurion. So if you tap in Geek Centurions on whether it be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you'll find us at the Geek Centurions. And yeah, that's about it. You got anything cool to say, Daniel? Uh, Halo looks cool. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe one day we'll talk about new mutants. Yeah, please. Whatever that comes out. Please, please do, do not delay it again. It's it's been delayed. I don't know how many times. Just release it on video on demand or Disney Plus, please. I, I just let me watch it, please. Right, dude. It's just. Hopefully the when the cat the the Winter Soldier and uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier show is going to be good. I guess it's supposed to be coming out soon. Oh, yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see you guys again sometime soon. This has been your boy. I don't know where I'm pointing, but it's supposed to be for Daniel. <laughs> well, I guess I'll sign it up. So, thanks for watching us, guys. Um, this is uh, 
This has been Daniel, and uh, this is by you know Bro over there. Yep, this is good old Eli, the host of the show for for a while. It's been uh, it's been fun. Hope you guys have a good one. Peace.